Hi there, welcome to episode 51 of Right Where You're Sitting Now. 51? Shit, we went, we went past episode 50. Yeah, you missed it. And didn't... You missed fuck. it. Did you not... You didn't set fireworks off or anything? Uh, no, I'm sorry, man. Was I supposed to? Yeah, I mean, you, the deal was you were meant to set fireworks off over there and I was meant to... They were meant to be so powerful that I could see them here. Oh, well. Okay. Okay. No, I, can, I, I believe that that's probably the deal, but I don't remember that, man. I'm sorry. I might just be gaslighting you. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, so as revenge for you daring to do a show without me last week and somehow misusing the ether to damage my microphone and so that only you and you alone could speak to Julian Vane. That's really... Okay, whatever. Keep going. <laughs> that's libel, I'm sure. <laughs> at least. That's at least libel. <laughs> <laughs> this week, uh, I decided to sit down with an old buddy of mine Jason, uh, Jason? Joseph Maffini um, who uh, will be known to older listeners of Sitting Now we used to do a show with him called Coincidence Control Network back in the day he was mm. a ho- co-host of that for a long time um, and Josh you were also a, a co-host on that and um, but he's also very well known in the alternate uh, reality gaming um, sphere he, he created a game called Ong's Hat which was a kind of online folklore and um, a kind of ongoing game that ran for years and years. It was absolutely amazing. He was also, you know, buddies with people like Robert Anton Wilson, Christopher Hyatt, all these kind of you know, luminaries of the scene that we're all fans of. So he's a, mm. a really cool, you know, he's a cool guy, good friend, and you know, we had to get him on. Um, unfortunately, Josh, you were busy with you know work, and I still feel like this was conveniently timed. To, like you said for revenge you said it jokingly but it's it's feeling like one of those jokes that's real you know there's always truth in jest is that what you're saying mm. anyway yeah well so this is what happens when you, <laughs> you curse my microphone from America anyway in the interview we discuss um, this thing that happened and so we're in the outro for the show so the first show we're bringing back the outro uh, and this is the first show, so listen after the interview this time round, and uh, we've, we're giving away some um, some interesting stuff. So the first ten people to uh, contact the email address that I provide um, will get a freebie um, sent to them, and it's quite a cool one. So listen to the end of the show uh, if you want to receive a nice free thing. <laughs> Um, that will probably make no sense until you listen to the interview and then you'll realise what I'm talking about. But anyway, let's, uh, let's roll the show and talk to Joseph Maffini. Hey, Joseph Maffini. Long time no see, uh, on the show at least. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, could you uh, give us a brief biography of yourself, and then we'll uh, we'll catch up. Brief biography of myself. Uh, I guess I you would say I'm a multidisciplinarian artist and storyteller. Um, I'm also a technologist by day, um, and uh, I've been doing this for hmm, God. I started I started doing this cross platform storytelling stuff online as far back as the late '80s, when I was on bulletin board systems. And and then kind of just, you know, uh, gravitated towards uh, Internet access as that became publicly available in the early 90s and have just been kind of continuing to expand and build on the, the methods that I use that uh, tell stories across platforms. So then and, and that's me. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but prior to all that, that sort of stuff, you sort of went through a kind of a, a kind of magical phase as well, didn't you? Like an occult phase or that you could. Oh yeah. 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 In the, in the, well, I was, I've always been trying to develop this, um, this idea of stories that don't live within one medium. I mean, as far back as my, is, is my thesis in, in college, which it, it used, um, a book of poetry and a, and a VHS videotape that you had to, like watch and read at the same time. And then like when it was all over, you were, you know, uh, the thesis actually sent everybody to a place and time where the last act was acted out in front of them. Um, so as you can see, I'm always been thinking in this kind of way. Um, and, and during that time, you know, always still actually, um, magic has been a part of my life because I consider magic and art the same thing, two different types of expression of the same 
the same impulse. Um, and uh, yeah, magic was really big in my life, especially in the 80s. I was very active in magical groups. Um, and uh, I, But I was also very active in the industrial music scene in Chicago in the 80s, too. So those, t- as if you know, as you know, probably those two things really went together back then. Yeah. Yeah, they're kind of like fish and chips, weren't they, at the same at that time? But um, so, <laughs> when did you? Um, what was it that kind of drew you into magic? Do you reckon? Like, what was the the like traditional magic? I suppose you know the Western esotericism. Yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, let's see. I, well, you know, I'm 59 years old, so my childhood, childhood, not my you know, not my teens, but my childhood was during the 60s and the 70s. Um, I graduated high school in 1980. So let's consider everything from 61 to 80, which was my childhood. Right. Um, and, uh, during those times, as you know, that there was the magical, uh, Renaissance that happened in the sixties and seventies, especially. And I was a horror movie fan. Um, uh, when I was a kid, I actually had a club that built the Ravel models, the monster models. Um, and so we were the monster model club that met at my house and, and we were just big fans of anything, hammer films and, you know, Bela Lugosi and, you know, obviously all those people. And, um, we, you know, every Friday and Saturday night, everybody would come to my house and do sleepovers and we'd stay up late and watch all the monster flicks. Um, and so, you know, through that, obviously an interest in the occult, you know, um, was there, I think that, I think it. I don't want to say one led to the other. I think they, they kind of simultaneously fed off each other that I had an interest in the supernatural and the occult. And, and so that was probably fed and, and, and fostered in large part by watching a lot of monster movies and paranormal movies and reading a lot of the literature. And of course, then in the sixties and stuff was really easy to get. I think the first thing I got my hands on when I was about, I'm going to say 12, was drawing down the moon mm. and and I read that and the great thing about that is it was a compendium in a lot of ways of different magical orders and what they believed almost like a, an encyclopedia of that kind of stuff yeah yeah and I remember discordian discordianism was actually mentioned it was my first run in with discordianism when I was like 12 um which you know years later um I ran across the Illuminatus trilogy and I went oh that and then you know of course one thing led to another after that but yeah so that's to, you know to uh, to put it to make it short that that was kind of like my introduction to the occult and the paranormal um and then you know i just kept building on that over the years more and more and more i think the first time i heard the word occult was in raises of the lost ark weirdly <laughs> as a oh, kid oh wow it, it yeah you're, where... you're too young to be though so right so yeah yeah i'm 42 so it's like um I think it was. There's a line in Raiders of the Lost Ark where they say, "Oh, Hitler loves the loves the occult" or something like that. And I was always like, "Oh, what's the occult? That sounds interesting. That like, sounds sort of <laughs> forbidden." And then, like like yourself, I became obsessed with Hammer movies as well. And they, I swear they're like yeah. Hammer movies and Robert Anton Wilson are the two gateway drugs to the occult. I swear. <laughs> I <think so. laughs> it's kind of crazy. Like, I've um, literally been visiting all the hammer houses recently. So we went to like Bray Studios and stuff because you can, a lot of them are like hotels now and like wedding yeah, venues yeah. and things like that. So you can just like, you know, just roll up and uh, we went to where the Hammer House of Horror TV series was filmed, the big house that's in the beginning of each episode. And that was kind of Oh, that's cool. awesome. I didn't, yeah. I didn't know that stuff was still standing. That's, that's yeah, really cool. Some of it is. And the, the um, Hammer used to own this. Uh, like this giant house where they used to film, well, they, if they, basically if there was a large house in any of the old uh, Hammer films, it was this place, and it's right next door to Bray Studios, which is this big, you know, like a t- like TV film production studio. But it's a huge, it's like Dracula's house in the original Hammer Dracula, and you can, yeah, you can stay there, you know, you can, you can rent a room and uh, go for a meal there. So we went for a drink there and checked out Dra- Dracula's house. It was quite a, you know, quite a weird experience after all those years going there but i'm gonna have cool. to come do i'm gonna have to come over and do that if i'm if i as an american am ever allowed back in the uk or the or, or the eu <laughs> as, as long as you walk through the uh you know the thing we have to walk through the airlock and then be sprayed down with uh <laughs> intense chemicals I, you know what not a joke i i see that coming that's that'll be that'll be like probably next year 
<laughs> so how's this? I'm always interested in the, like how it's this whole virus thing's affecting other you know other people and stuff. So how's yeah. it been for you? Is it how's how's the whole? I live really in the middle of fucking nowhere. I can, I can say I can say four letter words on this podcast, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> I, I live in the middle of nowhere in the in the far Pacific Northwest. Um, so I'm surrounded in every direction by impenetrable forest, basically. <laughs> um, and so uh, for me personally, uh, my immediate area runs a very low infection rate. I mean, our whole county, which is you know a huge area of, of land, is mostly national and, and state parks, um, with the exception of one or two little pockets of, of small populations. And we've just not seen I don't think we have a thousand um, confirmed cases in our entire county, and we have two or three deaths, all of which are like you know nine hundred year old guy in a in a nursing home or something. So, um, pretty I'm pretty unaffected um, personally, like directly personally. But uh, you know, I still live in the United States, and I had plans on doing things in Canada this this year, and uh, that's kind of like off the table. Um, and uh, and I don't want to travel around too much because the community I live in is is really uh, kind of cool and close knit and a lot of old hippies and a lot of young hippies kind of you know that kind of thing um, a lot of kind of punk alternative people anarchists a lot of anarchists um, people that came here to get away from everything and just kind of live alternative lifestyles and be left alone mm. and um, the the trust factor of me going off to Seattle and coming back and bringing the virus back into this community is not something I would violate and and thankfully not something most people in this community do violate either. So we're we're kind of just staying home and and living our in our little tiny little social bubble here and uh we're okay. I mean, we're fine. Using Zoom it's a lot. A, Everyone seems to be using Zoom. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I hate Zoom, but yeah. um like we 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 all wear masks when we're in each other's presence that we respect six feet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What and 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 so it's working for us. We're doing all the things that the rest of this country should have been doing from day one. Um, we've been doing. We actually. I remember having conversations with people in January and saying, "Do you see this thing happening in China? We got we got to watch this." And you know, um, some people online that I told that to like called me a paranoid conspiracy theorist, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, other people are like, okay, let's keep an eye on this. And so we actually did things like go out and buy stock, stocked up on food um, and, and all these kind of things that people were doing in April. We had already done in February. And so we just kind of sat back and watched the world go crazy. Um, it, it was kind of, I was kind of proud of the community too, um, you know, that we all pulled together and did that. But then again, I'm not, we're not a giant metropolitan area. So I could see why something like New York wouldn't be able to do anything like that. There's just too many people. It's too hard to get the information out. There's just too many factors to keep you from, you know, um, implementing any kind of policy that would really be effective. Whereas a small community like mine, it wasn't even a policy. We all had like a consensus agreement. This is probably the smart thing to do. And we did it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I mean, I'd like to say that we did the same here in England, but <laughs> um, no, we didn't. But um, the I think the thing that drives me crazy is whenever the, especially, I don't know if it's the same in the States, but whenever there's a um, like a new policy put in place, it, they always say, like, for example, you have to wear masks in shops, but it'll be said, but from the 12th of August. And you're like, why not just now? Like, why do we have to, why do we have to wait? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. I mean, I'm sure there's no, probably they some. That, they do that here too, even on the state level. They're like, uh, we're going to level four and that happens, you know, Wednesday, which is three days from now or whatever. And I'm just like, what do we have to do to prepare for this? Like, like you're, I mean, I guess maybe, I, you know, let's be fair. If you own a store and, you know, um, and that's a policy and there's a law involved and maybe you're liable to get fined, you know, I don't know, or shut down. Um, maybe they're just giving the news enough time to filter out to everybody. Does that make mm. sense? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But when it's two weeks' time, I mean, two weeks is quite a long time. I, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. But, dude, if you like, I, I'm the world's worst at that anymore. Like, I used to be, I used to be, you know, a news junkie, and I'm just not anymore because I just can't do it anymore. It's like it takes up too much of your life and too much of your time. So, you know, 
whereas I was the guy that used to tell everybody, you know, like, did you hear that thing that happened? And then three days later, everybody's talking about it. Now I'm the guy that gets told, you know, did you see that, you know, like Lebanon blew up? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> and then I go online and I, and I, you know, oh, OK, that's what they're talking about. I just I don't I don't I, I'm not um, trying to keep up with everything all the time anymore. I just like, you know, it's too much overload. And it's a minefield out there as well. I mean, politically speaking, especially, it's a minefield. It's uh, one thing I've really noticed, and this is like, it's bizarre. I did not see this one coming. Is this kind of drawing of a, like a line in the sand almost, um, politically speaking, especially in social media. It seems to have got, I mean, it's always been pretty bad on social media, but it's like next level bad now. Like people have gone radical left or radical right, and there doesn't seem to be a, there seems to be very few people still in the grey area in the middle. Do you know what I mean? It's crazy. It's, I don't know what caused that. Uh, maybe it's just people have had too much time at home or something. <laughs> I don't quite get it. It's weird because, yeah, I mean, I think that's part of it. I really do. And I, and I think that, um, you know, people are starting to go a little nutty from being shut up all the time and, and shut down. Um, you know, there's some people I've noticed that, like, the things they complain about are not things that I find to be something that you should complain about or should have to complain about. Um, but what they do. And. So there's all these people out there that are complaining about all this stuff. And, and I have noticed like it since the pandemic, especially if it could have like gotten any worse in this country, um, you would think not, but it, but it did, it, it got even the lines got harsher and, and shorter. So, uh, and people's patience, it's like, there's like all this weird shit going on. So yeah, there's part of, part of that that's caused me to retract from online life. And, and I no longer wish to be an online personality. Um, because there's just there's it, it just bogs you down in defending yourself from just horse shit that you shouldn't even have to be defending yourself from, and and it's not from just one side; it's from both sides. Yeah, and that's the crazy thing. But yeah, it, it used to it used to feel kind of victimized from people on the right wing, and then the left wing was always be like a place you retreated to. It felt like anyway. Yeah, it's been, it's yeah, recent. yeah. Not now. Anymore. Now it feels like I'm being attacked by both sides constantly, like mm -hmm. constantly. And every time I go on Facebook, it, yeah, it's crazy. And it, this whole, I mean, it's all, you know, identity politics and labeling, especially labeling. And this whole, th I, I, I named this thing social staining, where once, you know, you make one mistake um, and that's it, you're forever stained, you know, uh, in the yeah, eyes. We call, of, that can we call that cancel culture here. Yeah, I guess. Yes, cancel culture. But it's, yeah. and like, even if you're, you know, even if you apologize for something, I mean, this is not talking personally, but you know, I've seen it a bunch of times online. It's, it's kind of crazy. And it's like, it's sinister in a weird way. And I never thought I, I'm almost kind of, I've fallen out with people over this. And I'm kind of disappointed with the left almost, if that makes sense. I'm not, um, no, no, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. It's, I, I'm I, disappointed. I've been disappointed with the right. So now I've become disillusioned with the left as well. That's what's happened. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I wish there was like a. Um, there probably is somewhere in England where we could move. That's just <laughs> like a bunch of old hippies. I, I, I kind of like that idea. Just, you know, just talk to people via this podcast rather than dealing with social media ever again. That'd be quite nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, no, it's 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 really insane. But anyway, I'm sure people are bored to tears of hearing about pandemics and all this kind of stuff. Oh, one last thing I was going to talk to you about was did. The area you live in, was it affected by the Black Lives Matter protests at all? Because they seem to be like way, way more intense in America. Yeah, we, we um, I mean, you know, not to the level of Portland, obviously, but uh, like I said, there is a very large anarchist community in my neighborhood. Um, and uh, in fact, it's it's kind of considered, um, well, it, back in the, uh, the, what was it, the, the battle in Seattle, 99, was that? Um, when when uh when everything went like sideways up in Seattle, a lot of the people from that movement like ended up here. Um so, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh collectives here and uh a lot of um uh, you know, people living anarchist lifestyles but not the uh in your face uh proselytizing kind of anarchist, which I don't consider anarchy actually. Um and not the cancel culture kind of <laughs> anarchist. Um, which I don't consider anarchy as well. It's like if you either believe in uh, freedom of expression or you don't. Um, there's there's no like like deplatform this person. It's like no 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 fuck you. Um, and so there's, there's it's a you know pretty cool place. But we did have uh, a couple of nights of very large protests. 
um, and where people came out, you know, to show solidarity for the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and there was, I, I can find video for it for you uh, if you ever want to see it, but they basically was a Starbucks that got completely dis, dis, disassembled, like just deconstructed down to the ground, and the cops just let it happen. <laughs> What is it back with Starbucks? I almost feel sorry for them. <laughs> no, they, they just seem to like a target. Like, yeah, <laughs> so yeah. I almost feel sorry for the employees. You know, like they come to work the next yeah. day and there's like anti. But, but I think I think everywhere. Starbucks symbolizes gentrification on some level to a lot of people. You know, and homogenization. You know, like the mom and pop stores get pushed out. The the Starbucks and the WalMarts and you know the whatnots come in. Um, so I think it's just it, it's an easy target. Um, it, you know, it was closed. That helped. And, you know, and it's just like and it was right there where they were doing the protest. So I think they looked around. They went local business, local business, local business. Starbucks. Let's get that out of our neighborhood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was just like a mass revolt against the coffee or something in America. I don't think so. <laughs> I, I think most of those people I know, they, they drink lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> The Black Blood of Creativity. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I guess one thing I'd like to talk to you about is, um, well, the main thing I'd like to talk to you about really is ARG and your kind of involvement with that, and in particular, Ong's Hat and some other stuff you've worked on. Um, but let's start off. Can you just give? Because there's going to be people that listen to this that don't have a clue what Ong's Hat is. Could you kind of walk us through uh, Ong's Hat? Okay, well, from my perspective, it was a uh, uh, a Swiss Army knife approach <laughs> to doing art. Um, I had a lot of different interests. I was, you know, I was I was uh, studying uh, method acting in guerrilla theater, and uh, I had uh, interest in street art. And at the time, you know, this was back before the internet. Really, there was uh, Xerox machines were the were the internet before there was the internet. If you know what I mean. Um, and so you would, you would make pamphlets and posters and, you know, there was all this kind of stuff you would do. And, um, and then of course the bulletin board systems came along and, and I was looking at, uh, different things that I was doing at that time and thinking about a way to, as I said earlier, like I've always been thinking about a way to bring a storyline into multiple mediums so that to me, it was more, uh, a lifelike to to be reading something about a book and then maybe hear something about it on the radio. And like, this is how back in those days, you know, you would get information as piecemeal, right? So there would be a newspaper article you would read and then you would see something on TV and then maybe you would hear something on the radio and then you would like be walking down by the record store and you would see a poster, you know, and so you would get all these different perspectives on a particular issue, but from different medias and from different viewpoints, um, which I found interesting. And so I was trying to pull an art form together that kind of mimicked that um, so that it would be more immersive. Um, and so I started thinking about, um, you know, a way to do this. And then at the time I was hanging out back then with uh, Peter Lambert Wilson, a.k.a. Hakim Bay um, and, and Jim, Jim, Jim Kenline and Robert Anton Wilson and Nick Herbert. And I was hanging out with all these people. And in fact, there was a conference that we did called Taz. And I want to say that was 1993 in San Francisco. So all of these people were in my house for a week. Was that the temporary uh, autonomous zone, wasn't it? Yeah, that we, yeah. It was like a thing, like a thing we did at um, this uh, Commotion International, which was an anarchist collective performance space in San Francisco uh, in the mission. And um and so, like, everybody came to my – I lived in San Francisco at the time. I just moved from Santa Cruz. And so I had everybody just come to my house. I had this big two-story house in San Francisco, and I had everybody come there and just stay at my house while we prepped this thing. And then we did it. And then, of course, there was, like, a day or two afterwards where we recovered. Um, and uh, and during that, that kind of meeting – when, when I had everybody in front of me and, and, you know, we all could talk about things, I started explaining to people about this idea that I had for this, you know, method of performance. And the way I described it at the time, I, I still think is probably the best description. It was I wanted to build a performance space that was unmoored from space and time. So 
um, I was a really big fan of, of the type of art like you would go into an installation instead of like just going and looking at art hanging on the wall. I've always liked installation art. Um, I mean, I like art on the wall too, but like installation art has always been something that I found really compelling um, because I think it's it three-dimensional and involving that kind of art. You mean the kind of thing where you... A, where you walk into a room and the room is the experience, which is the art. Yeah, I right? love that sort of thing as well. Yeah, and, and it's it's immersive and involves all the senses. I think it's 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 more impactful. Like like it definitely makes a bigger impression. I think on you. Um, so I was trying to explain this to a bunch of people who, you know, obviously uh, Hawking Bay didn't know much about the internet and just really didn't care. Probably still doesn't. Um, Robert Anton Wilson was like, well, it sounds interesting, but like even he wasn't on the internet yet. Um, Resney was. I think I think Bresney was starting. To, yeah, I got Bresney his first account, so he got on the internet, but he was fairly new to it. So I was the only person there who really understood this network digital world that was out there and just about to become like huge, right? And I said, well, I want to do this thing. And Peter uh, Wilson had already ran this uh, Ongsat piece in Edge Detector, which was a print science fiction magazine. And him and Nick Herbert had shown me and Ken line had put together the catalog and shown me that. And then I said, okay, well, I'm going to create these other two pieces, which was the interview in quotes with Nick Herbert and the interview in quotes with Emery Cranston. And, and I'm going to like help you input on these other two pieces. And then it'll be like this four piece canon that I'm going to then take and online and I'm going to do this interactive thing with it. And they all said, okay. And, and that, that was really the birth of it. And then I started doing it. And of course, uh, nobody understood what I was doing because nobody really understood that medium. And so that was fine with me. Um, I just started doing it and then they were helping by, you know, Peter was like mass mailing the print catalog, the book catalog, as it was called, um, to like anybody and everybody. And it was being drop shipped from Hong Kong. And uh, Nick Herbert was passing it around to people. And then I was making pamphlets and having them stuffed in the racks at the Lebanon State Forest in Ongset or near Ongset in New Jersey. And, and, you know, like, so there was all this grassroots stuff that was going out. And I said, for the online piece, I said, this is like, you know, going to take several years, but I want to root this in this Internet culture as a myth that is an Internet myth in a lot of ways. Right. So like it's, it's this conspiracy slash myth that's rooted in this electronic culture. And and I think that was really the first one that of its type that did that. Um, and it was only later around 19 or around 2003. Um, that uh, I ran into other people that were doing started had started to do similar things, and uh, Dave Zabolski was one of those people, um, the late Dave Zabolski, and um, and you know I said that's really cool what you're doing, you know, and then he said, well we were influenced by what you did, you know, and I'm like, oh cool, we we can work together, and that's when the words ARG got attached, um, and then of course you know you know the rest of the history is. Uh, Microsoft Bungie was launching Halo, and uh, and they used an ARG to launch that. It was called I Love Bees, and then Spielberg was launching the AI movie, um, and then they used a, an ARG to launch that called The Beast. And so you know it just kind of like got rolled up in this whole, oh this is one of the marketing things you do for Hollywood bullshit, you know and. And it kind of like got out of our hands. Um, but there was a couple of golden years there between 2001, which is when I ended the Ong's Hat game, and 2004, um, where uh, there was some very cool grassroots things going on that were called ARG. And then, you know, like I said, it got picked up and incorporated pretty quickly into the marketing portfolio of launching large um entertainment product and and you know and then and then it became transmedia the name got changed to transmedia after that mm. yeah i remember hearing an interview on a transmedia podcast i was wasn't quite sure what was going on there <laughs> it seemed to it seems to have, like you say it seems to have been like all good things it seems to have been kind of 
um, assimilated, doesn't it, into the uh, into the corporate culture now, which is a shame. pretty quickly. Like if you, if you do anything, like Diane De Prima warned me of this years ago. What if you do anything that actually has any, you know, traction and and gains any little bit of his success, it'll be co opted really quickly. And then your job as the artist is to not sit around and mope about it, but to like an acrobat, as she said, you know, vault forward. And figure out what the next move is, and and she and because I was like kind of I was kind of grousing to her one day about, um, you know I really hate the fact that every time something cool happens it gets incorporated into into, you know mainstream culture and corporate culture and and it and it goes away the good thing about it goes away, and she said you should look at that as as the universe pushing you forward so that you don't just sit in one place but it's causing you to innovate and I'm like oh okay well look at it like that, cool. <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so let's talk about the kind of, I guess, the story of Ong's Hat, because there, there is a kind of a storyline. It's quite a few oh, yeah. different storylines, isn't there? But let's, talk, let's start off with the actual place, Ong's Hat, because it is an actual place, isn't it? Yeah. So it's a ghost town in New Jersey. Um, it's, in the, it's in the Lebanon State Forest area, the Pine Barrens, as it's known. Um, it has a lot of legends in that area, uh, the Jersey Devil, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things that, that, uh, you know, we'll talk about like the myth and then we'll talk about like kind of the meta myth, um, the, the actual myth, if you go out to Ong's Hat and talk to people that live there in that area, um, you, you will find out that that area has a lot of legends about weird things and weird groups that have lived in the woods and done weird things and had weird effects. Um, of course, you know, the, the story changes like a game of telephone, depending on who you talk to. And so you have to kind of like pull together a lot of the stories and then look at like, what is the, what is the gist of what's being said here? And basically the gist is that scientists from Princeton used to hang out in the woods. They used to go there to get away from, you know, the repressive uh, regime that was running the university, which was basically military funded. Um, and so there was a lot of things, especially during World War II, that they were afraid to discuss that were very theoretical, but they didn't feel comfortable discussing them in that environment. So it was just a short drive for them was that area in Ong's Hat where they could go have a picnic and talk more openly, you know, uh, probably thinking that they weren't being uh, spied upon and, and you know, eavesdropped on in that environment. And that bred this whole idea that there were weird experiments happening in the woods, um, that there were weird people doing weird things. The government comes into the, some of the stories. And there was uh, possibly, probably uh, either a nuclear spill or somebody dropped a, a nuke, um, you know, not, not, not one that like detonated, but like just, you know, dropped a, a missile or something and lost it and they were looking for it. So there was like, People that told me firsthand that they saw soldiers patrolling those woods that were wearing nondescript uniforms. In other words, they didn't have any kind of insignia on them. Um, and so, you know, that, of course, fed into the fact that there was rogue scientists in the woods doing who knows what. And now there's military or paramilitary people looking for them. And so, as you can imagine, this is a great brew of yeah, yeah. paranoia that, that makes for, like, great legends and so essentially um, that is the core of those legends is those two things like the Princeton scientists, um, even one of them, John Tukey, one on record is saying they used to make up uh, if they wanted to write about stuff that maybe they didn't want to attach their name to. They were being published in the scientific journals. They had a scientist whose name was a made up name that they would publish under that scientist's name and that they, his address was in Ong's hat. So even the, the Princeton guys were having fun with this as far back as like the forties and fifties. Um, so it's always been like this weird area that was a nexus for weird legends. So it's, you know, it was, it was the perfect vehicle for this whole thing. Um, and, and it has very Lovecraftian overtones to it, especially because uh, some people say that the, the Pineys were a big influence on Lovecraft. Um, the, uh, the kind of the inbred, village people that he liked to play with <laughs> yeah yeah the fish fuckers um <laughs> <laughs> they were they were kind of based on the pineys uh so i've been told i mean i don't know i, I didn't i didn't know lovecraft so i can't say for sure 
Um, yeah. So anyway, that's that's kind of like the 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 uh, the back the, the the backdrop of this. And so the meta story on top of that was that there was this this ashram did exist. It was made up of mystics and, and physicists, and they were uh, pursuing a method of dimensional travel, and they actually succeeded, and they made a breakthrough, and then in a very John Zerzan fashion, um, they discovered uh, one of the many multitude of uh, infinite Earths out there that uh, had everything that this Earth had except humans. It had never had humans, so it was like the pristine, you know, wilderness uh, uh, Earth, the 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 uh, the Eden, basically Eden, um, and that the that the these scientists were, you know, putting stuff in these in these dimensional vehicles and taking it over, and they were building a, a breakaway civilization, and that's and and they left these documents behind that if you're smart enough to decipher them, you too may be able to join them. Mm-hmm. That's quite cool. And then there was talk about the, the the egg and things like this. Yeah, so the so the egg was the device that was the dimensional device, and it harnessed um, energies uh, that were uh, trained using biofeedback um, and tantric sex and drugs, psychedelic drugs. So that the, the combination of these three three things puts you in a state where when you were attached to this machine actually enhanced and magnified the energy that you were generating, which then gave you the energy to break through on the, onto the dimensional scale and go, you know, to a place somewhere in alternate dimension, which was navigated to, through, uh, uh, an intuitive method, not really a logical method. And the only way to and back to there to get there and to get back successfully was to use this intuitive side of your brain that was highly developed through all these exercises that they were doing, which is where the the mystical side of all this came from. Like a lot of yoga and a lot of TM and a lot of biofeedback and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's cool. So how did you kind of begin um, sort of dispersing the information kind of thing? How did you kind of, um, not dispersing, that's the wrong word, but you know, like kind of, how did you? Uh, how did the game kind of begin? What the kind of the mechanics did you use? Um, I well, I first started. Like I said, I was. This was a long game, so I needed. I needed history on this thing, so I spent the first five years just distributing all the documents, um, which got the conversation kind of buzzing among the conspiracy community. Um, and there were people. I I know they knew. Um, like I, I would send the catalog to. Uh, you know, real booksellers that back then were people that were selling like um, alternative energy, uh, UFO, uh, you know, uh, book catalogs that were like, send me $2 to a PO box and we'll send you the book catalog back. You know, you remember those days probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, uh, and I would send it to those people. And then the next time I got their catalog, I would see it listed in their catalog is for sale for $2. <laughs> Which was funny because I'm like, okay, you're just Xeroxing my Xerox and you're selling it for two dollars, but okay, you're doing my work for me. Thank you. Like, you know. So like by sending it to that one distribution point, it would then go out to like how many hundreds of people, right? So I'm like, okay, cool. So it just started propagating like that. And uh I would go to um book shows, book conferences, um, or book fairs, I guess they're called, and uh and there would be people selling the selling the, the 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 stuff that I had sent them that had been Xerox. They were selling it on their tables, <laughs> and, and they'd be like, "Have you seen this?" And I'm like, "Oh no, what is that?" You know, and it was great. Um, and so it it kind of like uh, distributed itself in a lot of ways. I mean, I was very strategic, and and so I was pushing it strategically, but the effect was was what I was trying hoping to achieve. And then also uh, on the internet. You know, it was on like some of the original hacker boards, like uh, Temple of the Screaming Electron, and um, you know, like all these different uh, uh, Cult of Dead Cow. Like all these people, like were, just loved it because it was it was kind of a cyberpunk hacker story in a lot of ways. You know, um, that these people that lived in the middle of nowhere like hacked together this equipment and were able to do this great thing. Nobody took it seriously, of course, except for a few people on the fringes, but. You know, a lot of people like willingly distributed it without me even asking them to. So by the time it got to 1998, I felt like you know it was it was like really embedded. Um, Dimitri had been had actually copied it and put up a complete section on Deoxy. Do you remember Deoxy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Deoxy.org had a 
if you went to deoxy.org slash IRC, that stood for Incunabula Research Center, um, he had like a whole section of the website that was dedicated to the, the Incunabula stuff. And um, that was cool. And that gave it a lot of traction because, you know, in the early days of the web, uh, Deoxy was one of the biggest websites. And, um, and so that gave it a lot of traction. And then I purchased Incunabula.org. And then I started using that as kind of like a central clearinghouse and, and getting all the stuff there. And then I was watching the traffic just grow like to crazy amounts. Um, and so that's when I decided to do the, the interactive uh, CD-ROM. Hmm. You know, remember those things, CD-ROMs? Yeah, oh, yeah, and yeah. Um, <laughs> I so, I, so I did an interactive CD-ROM, which if you're interested in it, uh, there's the ISO is available on archive.org. Um, it's called the Incunabula Papers, Colon, Ong's Hat, and Other Gateways to New Dimensions. And it was uh, completely uh, kind of, it was like an interactive comic book is what it was. Um, that was the nexus of the game. And so I launched that in 1999. Um, got picked up by all kinds of media because um, a friend of mine from Adobe had left Adobe and she had started a company which was the first like really ebook company. Um, and so they used me as one of their feature authors. Um, and I sold a sh shit ton of, of uh, ebooks through that. And, and so that got picked up in like mainstream press. And so we were like in the New York times and all the examples they were using, of course, were my book, um, which was like, you know, like you can do an ebook and it could just look like paper or it can look like this guy's, you know, and, Mine was all color and rollover states and quick states and pop-ups and sounds and video. Like, you know, like I had like really done it up, like, you know, like CD-ROM and made it very game comic book like. Um, and so that's that like just went kaboom. And then um, and then obviously Art Bell called. <laughs> <laughs> of course, and believed yeah. every word of it. <laughs> I, no, I don't think so. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm. I have a different opinion about, about art. I think, um, and his people, I, I think that they, they know that half more than half of what they promote is horseshit, but I think they also know it makes for good radio. Um, and if art was anything, he was, you know, he was a good talk show host. And so of course he would be like, Hmm, that's interesting. You know, like all that kind of stuff, but I, I can't possibly conceive of anybody believing absolutely all of that stuff that he had on there. And in fact, there was time to tell that he didn't. Right. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, you're just, you're, you're, you're an entertainer. You're putting on a show. There's a guy literally on YouTube right now, streaming 24 seven art bell coast to coast shows. That, uh, um, mm -hmm. And I've just had them on in the background all week and it's been the greatest experience ever. I, I do love art bell. I, I love that. I especially love the, 80s and 90s art bell in particular it's like that's exactly, the golden era exactly. yeah yeah the, the the like back in the days when you would listen at 10 o'clock at night on your radio as you were like laying there like you know for the night turn down the lights and listen to art it was i used to call it scary bedtime stories and that in that in a lot of ways what it was right mm, yeah basically yeah yeah and, and and they were entertaining and nobody i didn't at least take it too seriously i think that came later when everybody started to flip out and like really take all this stuff, like, you know, literally. Um, but they make for good, scary stories to, to, to listen to at night. I think that was just generally a more fun time, wasn't it? It was like, it was. The, the, I mean, was the X-Files. Yeah. The X-Files. I was just about to say that the X-Files is like that, that whole period. And there was the kind of um, like the 14 time suddenly got a lot bigger. And there was like, you know, there, there was like a sort of, it was a nice version of what's happening now, basically, it wasn't it? It was kind of like a people seem gen there was like a sense of wonder about it, whereas now it seems to be a sense of dread about conspiracy and about all this kind of stuff. That's that's kind I of mean, back then. Back then, you would have your occasional person who was like took it all too seriously and would yell at you angrily, like accuse you of being intel and all that kind of stuff. And that that person was generally, you know, uh, the exception and not the rule. And and I think what's happened now it's it's become the rule and not the exception to to have the uh, the despair version of that now, which is like like you know I kind of I don't want to get into it too much, but that's kind of like what QAnon is capitalizing on. Whoever's running that thing, they're capitalizing on the despair aspect of of conspiracy, 
And, and, and you and I, I think, come from the Robert Anton Wilson aspect of cons- conspiracy, which is, well, there's some interesting things here. Like some of it's bad crazy, but some of it's kind of interesting. And and that's where we and that's where we end it. Like yeah, exactly. we're maybe logic people, I think, is what it is. Yeah, yeah. And and also like coming from a Discordian background, you tend to have more a more playful approach to that kind of stuff. And so that I got away with that until like I started to see the tide turning on that, and then you know more and more angry conspiracy theories started showing up, and uh, that's kind of when I said, okay, the game is over because this is not going where I want it to go anymore. Who was there? I mean, around that time, I suppose there was William Cooper, wasn't there? He was probably the main. He was like the Alex Jones of his time. I think Bill Cooper had just like got himself shot about that time. Yeah, yeah, he had to shoot out with the with the revenue agents. Yeah, so I mean, David Ike. David Ike was coming up at that time. Yeah, but he was kind of all about the reptiles then, wasn't he? He He was about all the reptilians. Yep, yep, yep. And even Uh, Alex Jones, who sort of turned up, even his early stuff, he was more obsessed with kind of Bohemian Grove and. yeah, kind of. He wasn't really as kind of aggressive and kind of. He, I never thought of him as right wing, even though, you know. It's no, he the, he started out as kind of more left libertarian. Yeah, uh, and then like he really he really grabbed the ball and ran with it with uh, 9-11, the whole nine eleven truther thing. I mean, that's it right there. That's when it got ugly. Is like after nine eleven, the truther thing started making it more and more ugly. And people from that milieu or attracted to that milieu started to crossfade into the UFO culture, the conspiracy culture, and the fun went out of it. And and that's when I got out of it because it's like, you know, and then also there was like around that time you had Kathy O'Brien and Mark Phillips getting really popular, which was the whole uh, MK, uh, uh, MK Ultra, but more monarch mind control and all that crap and Bryce Taylor and all those people. Um, so, you know, like it, it, those people, if you were, I don't know if you were hanging around any of those people back then, I unfortunately was, had them in my circle. Um, they're really unpleasant <laughs> <laughs> and, and like everything's a dread. Um, and, and on top of it, like there's nothing you can do that won't cause them to accuse you of being mind controlled at one time or another. It's like, you're like, Oh, I like, I like, I like, I'm telling you, I can't even think of anything. Like I like cake. Did you know that that's a sign of my control? You know, it's like, good God, you're tired. You're tiresome to be around. Yeah, that's it. It's, be, you, it, it, it's exhausting to try and. Um, it used to be fun because you could go down all these kind of crazy rabbit holes and there'd be like interesting stuff, and somehow it would lead back to the occult, and occasionally it would yeah. lead to like aliens and things like that. And it was kind of fun. There was a sort of, like I said earlier, a sense of wonder to it. And now it just seems tiring and exhausting, and kind of, it's just. I guess because we both kind of came up in the the existing version of conspiracy theory, didn't we? We were both, you know, where it was fun and kind of playful. Whereas now it's it, it's and you can't be fun or playful with it whatsoever. It's like it's its own thing now, and it's really depressing. I think it's a religion. <laughs> it's, it's really it's kind yeah. of a religion. Like, and that's what I started to notice around two thousand and one was a lot of characteristics of these of some of these movements, like like the Ike movement and other people. Um, uh, the, the Mark and Kathy, and there was there was like these other weird conspiracy groups out there that started to form. They really, really had the uh, characteristics of cults. And uh, uh, what was that? Was that one guy, uh, Mackezadek or whatever? Um, I can't remember. There, there was like all these people started springing up, and each one of them had their own cult and their own belief system. And that's when it got really boring. It, and 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 just like it didn't feel creative anymore, and it definitely wasn't fun. And you would run into the followers of these people, and they were less, even less fun, because you know they they just wanted to read through scripture, scripture and verse, you know. Yeah, <laughs> they all seemed like kind of quite normal people. I think that was another thing. Cause conspiracy always used to attract a kind of um, like an alternative type of person, wouldn't it? It'd yep, be like almost yep, like yep. like you know like the punk culture, the goth culture, all that kind of stuff. But whereas now you see a lot of it coming from kind of middle-aged women, you know, stuck at home on the internet or, you know, middle-aged, like strange guys. <laughs> it's, it's, it's... No, that, that's exactly what started happening was it, it kind of, I don't know if it was caused by, or, or again, I think, I think it was just like a, a synergetic effect of um, all these things that we're talking about. And the fact that around that time, 2001 to 
that's when you started to really see the internet become mainstream and you didn't have to have a, a computer science degree to get online anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, you had things like AOL and like all this, you know, so that's when that's when the housewives that had nothing better to do and and had no former exposure to the Internet started to come on. And if, if you remember during that period of time, there was almost like this adjustment period of like a year or two that everybody that each person needed to adjust to the fact that they were being bombarded by information all the time. And not all of it was very valid. A lot, a lot of it was not valid and, and you didn't have time in a lot of ways uh, to really practice any, <laughs> any kind of discernment. Um, it's like you, this one thing hits you. And before you had even time to really think about it, this other thing was hitting you. And like, you know, then it was like, now there wasn't, a person in your living room talking to you or on the phone talking to you. There was 20 people on a web board talking to you at the same time. And I think, I think that overwhelmed a lot of people. You yeah. Know? I start to find, I, I, the older I get, the, the more overwhelming I find that kind of style of information. I think that's the real sign of my age, but you do see, I mean, I have ADHD, so my brain is capable of jumping around quite a bit, but it seems to be even, it seems to have flown past that level of, of, of uh, you know, kind of being able to, multitask almost it's crazy the and yeah i did i i just sort of i don't know maybe i was getting old and i did, i missed those days where it was fun you know <laughs> dude i was just talking to somebody the other night from back from those days um uh, i said do you remember when we used to just stay up all night and surf the internet looking at all the interesting web pages when's the last time you did that i can't remember the last time was i did that i mean websites like you basically shop on the web now, don't you? And then you use, yeah, 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 yeah. and you use like um, Facebook and you know all these other things now. You read the newspaper, you shop online, and you talk to your family or you know your extended family on Facebook and Twitter, um, and that's about it. Like back back when the internet, when the web first like kind of became, I'm going to say like ninety five when it really like started to become something, a, a, a website was a destination and it was a destination that had a lot of artistic elements to it. Um, and, and that's just like, when's the last time you saw a website that was done for the pure joy of doing a piece of art that was interactive? I can't yeah. remember. I mean, like, do you remember the, the glory days of geo cities and all this kind of stuff? Oh yeah. And those pages were like, they definitely weren't works of art, but they were no. <laughs> <laughs> blink tag, marquee tag. There was, but but what they were is they were expressions of uh, somebody's passion, right? So somebody had an interest in something, and they took the time to go on GeoCities or Yahoo websites and get, you know, a, a free website and sit there for days and like just as a passion project, just build this thing about you know. The theory that I have that David Bowie was actually Paul McCartney or, or whatever it is, right? You know, and and it, but it was a passion project. It was like you could tell the passion was there. It was like you it came through, and it might not have been the prettiest thing to look at in the world, <laughs> but yeah. but it definitely was interesting, you know, because you could tell it was it was somebody's passion. It'd be like three flashing UFOs, sort of in a, like a GIF kind of thing, wouldn't it? Just looping over and yeah, over. Yeah, yeah. Like spinning like tops or something like. <laughs> yeah. And like flashing, like really he like highlighted, big, you know, big typeface text. I remember. Oh, it. Yeah. I, I loved all that stuff. It was great. Flashing and marquee H one tag, you know, it's like just yeah, and it was like, and then it would be like a black background with like magenta type. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to like highlight with your cursor just so you could read it. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to Wong's Hat a moment, what what was the kind of aftermath of Wong's Hat? Because I remember when I saw there was that documentary that came out a few years ago about the ARG that happened, I think in San Francisco, where um, oh, the Jejun Institute, yeah, 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 and then there was a real backlash against the guy, the guy, the creator of the game kind of thing, wasn't there? Afterwards, like people felt because well, he of... tried to he tried to do follow it up with the commercialization of the of the community. Mm. So what was that's uh, what was your experience with like on tap when you kind of revealed it all, as it were, at the end? Yeah, my experience was that um, it was a lot of fun. Um, all the aspects of what I was trying to do were successful with the. Up to a point, with the exception of one, and, and I'm not going to – Denny Unger ran – put together and ran a web board for me called Dark Planet, which 
was was a great thing. And Denny's now the CEO of like the hottest uh, virtual reality video game company in the world. So, you know, he, he's a very talented person. Um, and and this was and, and his web board was a passion project, um, and it got really 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 popular, and it was a lot of fun until it wasn't. And when it wasn't, when was when several like died in the wool conspiracy theorists, I would say, um, hooked up with a couple of not so uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for. Uh, Basically, they they were trolls. So there was like there was like a couple of trolls who just wanted to see the whole thing torn down and ruined, um, because various reasons. But and then and they hooked up with the diehards, and then the diehards and the trolls just kind of like ruined the web boards for anybody else. Um, and so I just got tired of the whole. And at that point, I'm like, well, nine eleven has happened. Um, the, the game Majestic that I was working on with EA got canceled because of that. Um, there's all this like, you know, negative energy coming through after 9-11 about conspiracies. And I don't know that I want to play into that. So I just like, I'm like, okay, game over. Like basically that's, that's what I called it. Just, just, you know, like we've done everything we can do with this. We're going to move on because it wasn't, it wasn't, it was not a zero sum game. It was supposed to be an infinite game, which meant theoretically that play could have gone on forever. But what I felt had become missing in the in the community was play. Um, a lot of people got freaked out and disillusioned and walked away after 9-11 because of 9-11, just like a lot of people probably have walked away from things because of the pandemic. You know what I mean? It's like your your mindset is not necessarily um, in doing frivolous things and, and entertaining things when your life could be in jeopardy and it doesn't matter if it is or not. If you perceive it to be, then that's going to have a bearing on your disposition. And we were having a lot of fun. And then I noticed that like the fun started to creep out of it and some very ugly uh, personalities started to be, become interested in the community. And I think they became interested because they were looking at, at it as a place where they could draw followers and build their own little cults, you know, a personality. Um, and I wasn't going to be, part of that either and denny didn't want to be part of that so uh we just like kind of said okay cool guys it's been a lot of fun and there's some things happening in the world now so we should all pay attention to our families and you know goodbye (laughs) (laughs) a lot of people said it was rather abrupt and it was actually rather abrupt because i just read i just reached a point where i just i get so tired of dealing with all these people that were um you know they, they had all these different agendas that none of which were agendas i agreed with um, so I just kind of like said, okay, this is taking up way too much of my time and energy and, and I need to like, just go take a break, which I did. So did you, do you ever get people that haven't picked up on the fact it's a game yet? And they kind of get all the time, you? <laughs> all the time, all the time, so, so much so that it, that I, I, you know, a couple of years ago, I'd adopted a policy of 99.9% of the time. I just don't respond. Um, you know, and then they, they contact me through my contact form on my website. Um, and there was, there was a period of overlap there where I was getting back to these people and trying to have a conversation with them about, you do understand that this was a performance art project slash game. And that, you know, it was a new way, it was a new way of expressing stories via new medias that were not available to us before, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then they either get violently angry and call me a fraud and threaten me, or um, they they want to argue with me about it <laughs> that in fact it's real and they know it's real because and then they have all these different reasons why or or they accuse me of like yeah of course you're going to shut up I guess the powers that be bent your fingers back didn't they and it's like yeah sure okay that if that if that's what it takes to make you go away that's what it is. So I mostly just I just don't respond to people anymore. Yeah, that's probably the best thing to. I just realised that for this whole interview, I've had um, the wrong microphone plugged in. So hopefully the listeners aren't going to be too annoyed about that. But uh, um, I probably sound a little bit different now. I've just switched to the microphone I was meant to be using. <laughs> oh, well. Okay. No, that's fine. It's it's cool. Well, um, that's you know I'm sure the listeners are used to way worse from us. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine you've got quite a few. Um, kind of oddballs contacting you we get quite a few as a result of the 
of sitting now obviously over the years i've had some some strange interactions i keep getting emails from this guy called cameron i don't know do you keep, have you heard from this guy this um liminal guy oh the, the guy with the book yeah 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 i got I, he, I, yeah dude dude he contacted his, or his oh so i'm making air quotes everybody you can't see his people contacted me um there's these people that claim to be his publisher i i don't know about that but um there's these people that claim to be his publisher um that claim that they got the book because cameron delivered it to him or somebody delivered it to him for cameron or whatever and that it was supposed to be a it was it's a, a not a it's a, a treatment that was originally written uh t- to be made into a movie um I don't, I don't know if I believe that because it's 44 pages long, which is like 106 by nine pages. Um, which that's long for a treatment. A treatment is 10 to 20 pages. So I think this is a novella disguised as a treatment. Okay. That's, 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 that's my take on it. Um, and, uh, yeah. So anyway, he, they, they, we'll say they, they contacted me and some other people that we know, I think Joe Nolan and, uh, uh, Michael Zool and a couple other people were contacted by this guy. Um, and so it looks like, and if you read the, the, if you read the treatment, you'll see that there's a couple of references in the beginning to uh, legend tripping online, the search for wrong hat and things like that. So obviously he's familiar with my work. Um, and so I think that's why he kind of targeted me and a couple of people that I know, including you, obviously. Um, and, and thinking that we would be simpatico. And, and he's not wrong. I mean, I didn't, I didn't dislike it. Um, yeah, but I, but I, what I don't know is if he really believes this happened to him or if this is an experiment in fiction, like some sort of like, not quite an ARG, we'll call it. Um, but definitely using methods of ARG to, to, uh, propagate this thing. And, 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 and actually the, you know, like, so read it yourself. Anybody who's listening to this, if you want, um, there's a, web, it's called, there's a website. It's called uh, Lim- Liminal by Cam. Oh yeah, the the website. So that that's the other thing. It's like there's a QR code that's on the book. Yeah, it's and like the, and when I got it, I I got some stickers too. Did you? Yeah, get I got stickers? the stickers, and I got like this. It's the yeah. book's got like a giant QR code on the front cover, and you scan that, and it takes you to yeah. a website called Where Is Cameron WTF. I think that's right. Yeah, <laughs> which I didn't even know you could get WTF domains. Now I'm jealous. Yeah, but, same. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so if you go there, it'll give you links to free copies of the book. And I think there's like Amazon copies of the book as well. There's, um, yeah, so I don't want to ruin for anybody, but yeah, the, this guy's apparently making the rounds and, and contacting everybody and like sending this book out, which, you know, was kind of interesting that, that he's just flooding the market with free books. Maybe he doesn't want to sell them. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Um, but it's, there's some pretty heavy stuff it, in there. But isn't it? I, I think it's, I think it's an interesting read. What do you think? Yeah, yeah, some kind of quite heavy stuff in there, isn't there? Kind of like a real mishmash of yeah. like, kind of, it's kind of like tech and sort of mysticism and kind of this strange kind of semantic virus and it's it's cool. It's yeah, a cool. Yeah. I mean, even if it's he kind of has every. I think in a lot of ways, I think it was written to appeal to somebody like you and me, yeah. Ken. So yeah. it's a, like it has. A, we have a little Burroughs. We have a little Wilson. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's cool. So yeah, so yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's that's cool that he contacted you though. So yeah. that's uh, yeah. So um, and the other thing is, you should, you should see if you can get that guy on your show. But I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, seems. I'm not sure if he's seems even, pretty cagey. Yeah, pretty cagey. I'm not even sure if the the guy's the lie. If you read the book, it's it's hard to tell. Yeah. Anyway, I, I recommend people should get if they can get their hands on this book, they should definitely. It's just called Liminal by Cameron. Cameron Whiteside there we go and um yeah it's definitely worth worth a read if you're interested in the kind of stuff we talk about here you should definitely try and track it down because it's a it's a yeah and puzzle on that name a little bit but okay yeah, yeah okay sure yeah. Cameron Whiteside yeah <laughs> but yeah no um weirdly the publisher got in contact with us and I think we've got some codes to give away for I think it's either for the book or for an audio version of the book I'll stick a thing at the end of oh, the nice. show yeah so um yeah. So we'll... yeah, they gave me uh, they gave me like twenty print copies that I gave away on my mail list. Oh, cool. <laughs> uh, I did a I did a first curve first serve because I'm like, what am I going to do with these things? And they're like, oh yeah, I have a mail list. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mine's even signed. So that's uh, that's quite cool. So 
I have the I have the hand of Cameron on my book apparently, so it's hard to tell. Yeah, he gave me uh the twenty that he gave me were all signed and had stickers. Oh cool, yeah. I got the little QR code stickers, that was cool. But yeah, no, well I'll at the end of the show or at the beginning of the show, I might have already done it there, um I'll I'll give out some of these codes so people can get hold of nice. whatever it is. So yeah. Um anyway, dude, it's been good to have you on. Uh, it's been a long, long time actually. when was the last time we yeah, recorded yeah. together? It was probably I think the last time we did like the show probably around oh bleh, 12 yeah 2012 yeah we did a 2012 show didn't we i remember so we, we used to do a show for the listeners that don't realize we used to do another show on top of city now called coincidence control network or ccn uh, which you came up with the name for and uh i did yeah um that ran for quite a long time actually that show i think we got up to almost 100 episodes of that and um yeah yeah, that was we should do it again. Yeah, we should do something something <laughs> similar to that. We've been talking about it. Josh, who's normally the co-host on the show with me, um, is keen to do something like a bit like that, but maybe a little bit more. Com- maybe we'll do a twist on that. You know, something similar to that. But um, as a or what, what what might be fun is like do uh, like do a reunion, like one big reunion show, and have like Joe Nolan on, and uh, who knows? Maybe we could dig up Nick Pell. I don't know what happened to him. He just like fell off the planet in 2014. He was, but... he was in Ireland last time I contacted yeah, him. Yeah, that's the last time I heard. I talked to him on on uh, Skype. 2014. I was in San Francisco doing a, a contract for uh, Google, which ended up being Pokemon Go, and um, yeah, and I talked to Nick, and then and then I just never heard from him again. And I heard he moved to Ireland. Mm, yeah, he got married, I think, and moved to Ireland. That was the last thing I heard. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah. And then there was another guy that used to do the show sometimes with us as well. I've forgotten his name. He's a friend of yours, I think. Oh no, he's a friend of Nick's. He was a writer, Douglas something. But yeah. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so we've got. Yeah, maybe we should just do a mega show where we also sit down on Skype and do a one-off. That would be quite cool. And then uh, I'm quite up for doing yeah. some more um, something similar, um, but a bit different. But we'll go into that at another time. But uh, that's definitely what so yeah. I reckon you should join us on um but yeah it's always great to talk um and too, man. yeah so let's uh let's do it again soon um yeah thanks for coming on yeah thank you see what happens josh when you leave me out of podcast episodes like you so did last week with uh with uh, uh julian vane I told you I was sorry. <laughs> I get Mr. G- uh, Joseph Matheny on, and we drop we drop bombs. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't don't say it in an airport. What do you mean you drop bombs? What are you, what are you talking about? Knowledge bombs, you know. It's, a, <laughs> it's awesome to have Jay back on. Jay's a personal friend of mine and just an awesome guy. He's like kind of one of these. Uh, he's one of these guys that's just. He has his fingers in every pie, you know. He's, he's he's his name crops up all over the place, and he's he's got such a cool take on like everything, <laughs> which yeah. I really like. Yeah, he's a well, like I told you before too. He's a he's a character too, though. Everybody knows about his projects. Nobody seems to know about Joe, you know. And that dude is awesome. So we spoke a, about this uh, weird Cameron Liminal book thing. Um, their pub the publisher sent me a bunch of codes for for audible um so you can get a i think it's like an audio version of the, i haven't actually downloaded one myself i should probably should i've got the book um but the uh if you want one email me at uh where should you email me at actually uh ken at sittingnow.co.uk that's s-i-t-t-i-n-g-n-o-w.co.uk and the first 10 people to uh email me will get a free you know, uh, download link and they can listen to this weird weird tale um, it's it's really it's like Jay says it's kind of like it feels like it was tailor made for people like us so um, it mm. is an in- interesting read or listen I guess in this case but uh, um, well worth it it's it's you know if anything it'll it'll give you a bit of entertainment for a, a short period of time and it's well, well worth it so the first 10 to email ken at sittingnow.co.uk uh, will get um, a code sent to them and instructions on how to redeem said code uh, yeah so um, if you're interested in our show in any way come and check out our YouTube channel it's youtube.com forward slash sitting now um, uh, if you, you could leave us a review on iTunes if you're you know if you're digging what we're doing that would be really cool um, and we're on Spotify and Alexa tune in and all sorts of things so you, there's no excuse basically we're everywhere 
we get we get around yeah broadcasting in all channels these days so <laughs> yeah um turn it up far more organized than we were before it's, it's, it's quite impressive <laughs> anyway so yeah uh thanks a lot for listening and we'll see you next week with dr david shoemaker